even saw the gun. She just answered the door on a spring day in 1992 and spoke briefly with a teenage girl who claimed that Mary Jo's husband was having an affair with her little sister. In disbelief, Mary Jo had turned away. Then the girl shot her. Over the next several years, the story of Mary Jo and the Long Island Lolita captivated the nation. Who was the 17-year-old girl Amy Fisher who had shot Mary Jo in the head? What had truly happened between Fisher and Mary Jo's husband Joey Buttafuoco? And why had Mary Jo decided to stand by her man? This is the story of Mary Jo Buttafuoco the woman who survived getting shot in the face by her husband's teenage lover. At first, May 19, 1992, seemed like a typical day for Mary Jo Buttafuoco, with her children at school and her husband Joey out of the house. Mary Jo decided to take the time to paint some benches in the backyard of her two-story white house in Massapeka, Long Island. Then, she heard the doorbell ring. When she answered it, she found herself face to face with a teenage girl. The girl introduced herself as Anne Marie and said that she needed to speak with Mary Jo about her husband. Assuming that the girl wanted to know something about Joey's auto repair business, Mary Jo stepped outside. Then, the girl brought Mary Jo's world crashing down. As Mary Jo later said on the Oprah Winfrey show, Anne Marie claimed that Joey was having an affair with her little sister and offered up a t-shirt from Joey's auto repair business as proof. I kind of looked back and asked, how old are you, 12? Mary Jo remembered. I couldn't believe it. Convinced after a couple of minutes that the girl was lying, Mary Jo turned go back in the house. I wasn't frightened, she told Oprah. I didn't feel that I had to fear that something was going to happen. I'm in my own house. It's broad daylight. Cars are driving back and forth. She's smaller than me. But as Mary Jo Buttafuoco turned, she suddenly felt a sharp blow against her head. The girl had pulled a 25 caliber semi-automatic pistol from her pocket and hit Mary Jo hard against the back of her skull. Then she fired into her right temple. I thought she hit me with a baseball bat, Mary Jo told Oprah. My thought was, where did she get the bat? After being shot, Mary Jo Buttafuoco was rushed to the hospital in extremely critical condition. With a severed cartoid artery, she spent two days on a respirator. But Mary Jo miraculously survived and soon offered up a description of her assailant. Then, to Mary Jo's shock, her husband Joey said that he knew her shooter. The girl who had come to the Buttafuoco home was not named Anne Marie, he said, but Amy Fisher, and Joey Buttafuoco had not had an affair with her little sister, but with the 17-year-old Fisher herself. Slowly, the details of their affair fell into place. Joey and Fisher had met at the end of 1990 when Fisher brought her car to his auto shop for repairs and by the summer of 1991, they'd begun a sexual relationship. Joey claimed that he tried to end it, and that that was why Amy Fisher had decided to go to their home and kill his wife. The young lady would have no part of ending the romance, Police Sergeant Daniel Severin told the New York Post in May 1992. For her, it was a fatal attraction. Two days after shooting Mary Jo Buttafuoco, police arrested Amy Fisher and charged her with attempted murder and criminal use of a firearm. From that point on, the story of Mary Jo, Joey, and Fisher, whom the press dubbed the Long Island Lolita, captivated Americans across the nation. As 
across the country watch the story of Mary Jo Buttafuoco, Joey Buttafuoco, and Amy Fisher twisted and turned. At court, Fisher's lawyer, Eric Nyberg, depicted Fisher as the wronged party. She is a victim, a horrible victim. I will never stop portraying her as a victim, Nyberg said. He alleged that Fisher had only tried to kill Mary Jo on Joey's suggestion. Indeed, Amy claimed that Joey told her that when Mary Jo answers the door, don't even wait for her to open the screen door. Just shoot and keep shooting. In the end, however, the jury didn't buy it. Amy Fisher pleaded guilty to reckless assault and was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Meanwhile, Joey Buttafuoco faced charges of his own. Since Amy Fisher had been a minor when they began their affair, Joey Buttafuoco was charged with statutory rape. In November 1993, he pled guilty and was sentenced to six months in prison. However, in the years that followed, both Amy Fisher and Joey Buttafuoco changed their stories. At a parole hearing in 1999, Fisher took full responsibilities for her actions. Despite allegations that Fisher had suffered abuse at the hands of her father and her lawyer, Nyberg, she said in court that she was the only person responsible for shooting Mary Jo Buttafuoco. I'd like to say something to Mary Jo, Fisher said. What happened to you was not your husband's fault, not your fault, not my father's fault, and not Eric Nyberg's fault. It was my fault, and I have spent the last seven years trying to figure it out. For her part, Mary Jo offered Fisher her forgiveness. She has shown true remorse and sorrow for what she did to me, Mary Jo told the court. Turning to Fisher, she added, You are being given a second chance in life, and I pray you will take it and make something positive out of all this tragedy. As a result, Fisher was released from prison soon afterward, but whereas she offered contrition for her actions, Joey Buttafuoco had no such change of heart. Fisher was never a girlfriend, never a lover, Joey Buttafuoco told USA Today in 2003. The prosecutor spent so much time and money coming after me, they had to get a conviction. And through it all, Mary Jo Buttafuoco continued to physically and emotionally suffer from the aftermath of the shooting. She was deaf in one ear and wouldn't regain the ability to smile until 2017. Plus, she faced harsh criticism from the public for staying with her husband. The kids were little. I was raised Irish Catholic. I didn't know anybody who ever got a divorce, Mary Jo told Oprah. My anger, and I look at it now, and I cringe because I was so angry back in the day, was that it turned into this, did he or didn't he, instead of, hey, what about me? In the aftermath of the shooting and the trial, Joey and Mary Jo Buttafuoco relocated to California, and even when Joey was arrested in 1995 for soliciting sex from an undercover policewoman, Mary Jo stayed with him until 2003. Then she filed for divorce. In the years afterward, Mary Jo did some deep thinking about both her husband and her would-be killer. In 2009, she published a book called Getting It Through My Thick Skull, Why I Stayed, What I Learned, and What Millions of People Involved with Sociopaths Need to Know. This was about her relationship with Joey. Joey Buttafuoco is a sociopath. There, I said it. Sad but true, Mary Jo wrote. 
the man who stole my heart in high school, whose large, hard-working Italian family embraced me, who constantly professed undying love and devotion, with whom I shared a million happy, fun times, is a sociopath. Mary Jo also thought about Amy Fisher. After Fisher appeared on Oprah and offered an apology, Mary Jo felt that Fisher hadn't ever deeply examined what she had done. There's no emotion. There's no real feeling, Mary Jo told Oprah. I believe with all my heart now she is sorry. I know she feels terrible, and she really is remorseful, but I don't think she's ever gotten it. What on earth made me, at 17 years old, walk up to that lady's house and put a bullet in the side of her head? She just won't go there. Remorseful or not, Fisher staged a public but fake reunion with Joey in 2007. That event, Mary Jo later said, helped inspire her to write her book. In the end, Mary Jo Buttafuoco is lucky to be alive, but the drama surrounding her teenage attacker, her philandering husband, and their dramatic trials have distracted from the heart of the story. On the TV show Scandal Made Me Famous, Mary Jo put what happened to her in stark terms. It wasn't an assault, she said of that May Day when Amy Fisher shot her in the head. It was an assassination. died after falling down a staircase in 2001. Her husband was convicted of her murder. But did Michael Peterson really kill his wife? On December 9th of 2001, Michael Peterson found his wife, Kathleen Peterson, dead at the bottom of the back staircase in the 11,000 square foot mansion that they shared with their children in Durham, North Carolina. She was lying in a dried pool of her own blood. A forensic analysis showed that she had been lying there alive for hours before Michael called 911 around 2.40 a.m. He claimed he found her after lingering outside for several hours after dinner, but the police soon arrested him and he was found guilty of Kathleen's murder in 2003. However, Michael Peterson was released from prison to serve house arrest in 2011 after a judge found that a witness had misrepresented facts at the trial. And since 2017, he has been a free man after his charges were reduced to manslaughter and he was released on time served. But despite a 10-part Netflix documentary about Kathleen Peterson's death and now an HBO miniseries called The Staircase, starring Colin Firth as Michael and Tony Collette as Kathleen, the circumstances surrounding her fall remain a mystery. And one intriguing theory involving an owl suggests that it may not have been a murder at all. Kathleen Hunt was born in Greensboro, North Carolina on February 21st, 1953. She was a successful student and was the first woman admitted to Duke's University School of Engineering in 1967, where she earned her bachelor's and master's degrees and met her first husband, physicist Fred Atwater. Kathleen and Fred married in 1977 and had a daughter, Caitlin, but they divorced after she discovered his affair. Shortly afterwards, Peterson, then still Kathleen Atwater, moved to Durham, North Carolina and met Michael Peterson, a local novelist and occasional columnist for the Durham Herald Sun, who had served in Vietnam with the Marines. Although Michael was 
was still married with four children of his own. The new couple merged their families in 1987. Kathleen's career as a telecommunications executive was thriving, and Michael had received a half million dollar advance on a book deal. In 1992, they bought a 14 room mansion on three acres in the Forest Hills neighborhood. By 1997, Michael had finally divorced his wife, and he and Kathleen officially married. Over the years, there had been some tense moments over money and Michael's mayoral election bid, and the two frequently fought and made up, but nothing could have prepared the family for what would happen shortly before Christmas in 2001. Around 2.40 a.m. on December 9th of 2001, Michael Peterson called 911 to report finding Kathleen at the bottom of the back staircase in their million dollar mansion. He told the operator she was still breathing, but by the time paramedics arrived, they couldn't find a pulse. He told police she may have fallen after mixing alcohol and Valium, but was unsure because he was outside when she fell. Toxicology showed a blood alcohol content of 0.07%, just under the legal limit, and blood concentration of Valium, consistent with a therapeutic dose. But the autopsy also revealed she sustained several lacerations on her head as a result of beating and died from blood loss hours after she fell. Soon, the investigation looked inward at Michael as more of their personal life came out. Within days, the police arrested Michael Peterson and prosecutors charged him with first-degree murder. During the trial, evidence suggested she was hit with a fire poker after a heated argument about Michael Peterson's closeted sexuality. Evidence was found of Peterson soliciting male escorts and was paying for sex when Kathleen was murdered. Though it is unknown how Kathleen may have felt about Michael's bisexuality, the prosecution argued that she would not have tolerated his infidelity. She divorced her first husband for his own indiscretions years before, and they said it is unlikely that she would have felt differently about Michael's own cheating. This, they said, led to a heated argument that ended with Michael pushing Kathleen down the stairs. The defense challenged this version of events. Michael Peterson's attorney, David Rudolph, told the court, Show me one piece of evidence, one person who says that Kathleen was upset because Mike was bisexual, or Kathleen was upset because Michael was seeing other people outside the marriage. Not one shred of evidence. Not one. In response, the prosecution also argued that the motive could have been money. The Petersons were heavily in debt, owing over $100,000 in credit debt. It was revealed during the trial that Kathleen was the only owner of their mansion and car, and that Michael may have been enticed by her $1.8 million life insurance policy. Kathleen's company, Nortel, had a mass firing, and the couple worried she might also lose her job leaving the pair without a source of income to maintain their lifestyle. Her life insurance would have ensured Peterson would be able to maintain his public persona. On October 10th of 2003, the jury found Michael Peterson guilty, and the judge sentenced him to life in prison without parole. After several appeals, he entered an Alford plea, meaning a defendant acknowledges that the prosecution has enough to convict them, but maintains their innocence. In 2017, to have his charge reduced to manslaughter. The 
judge resentenced him to 86 months, and Michael Peterson was released with time served. What is yet to be determined was how exactly Kathleen met her demise. During one of Michael Peterson's appeals, an unusual theory emerged about Kathleen Peterson's death. She was not murdered after all, but died after being attacked by a barred owl. The theory, left out of the 2018 Netflix documentary The Staircase, posits that the lacerations found on Kathleen Peterson's scalp were caused by the talons of an owl that had attacked her outside. Then she stumbled indoors and disoriented, fell down the stairs and was knocked unconscious, unable to call for help. According to Cosmopolitan, barred owls are native to the area and known to attack joggers with some frequency, and a 2009 forensic analysis detailed traces of wood splinters and cedar needles in her hair, along with microscopic bits of feather. The report also noted that she had been found holding clumps of her hair when she died. And an owl expert testified that the appearance of a trident with three limbs converging to a point at roughly 30 degrees from each other and a fourth limb converging to the same point at nearly 180 degrees from the center of the other three limbs. Still, experts could not say with certainty that this was her cause of death and some believe that Kathleen Peterson died of simple malicious negligence, that Michael chose not to help Kathleen after an accidental fall. Others theorize that one of Michael Peterson's sons may have killed her out of jealousy, or that a tree branch may have been the actual murder weapon. Though one of their sons was at the scene before police, and the tree branch would have been easy to dispose of and could explain the needles and feathers, many of these and other theories do not have enough evidence to hold up to scrutiny. As the story is once again brought to living rooms across the nation, with HBO's dramatized telling of The Staircase, Kathleen Peterson the scholar, mother, and advocate may finally get the attention she deserves. Aspiring screenwriter Ray Rivera was just 32 years old when he disappeared on May 16, 2006. About a week later, he was found dead under strange circumstances at Baltimore's historic Belvedere Hotel, and the mystery remains unsolved to this day. When Ray Rivera's death first made headlines in 2006, it originally seemed like a suicide. About a week after the 32-year-old aspiring screenwriter vanished, his body was found inside an abandoned conference room at Baltimore's historic Belvedere Hotel. Having plunged through the roof of the room, his corpse had been lying there for days. Authorities concluded that Rivera had jumped off the top of the 14-story building and crashed straight through a lower roof of the empty meeting room, landing on the floor. But did Ray Rivera really take his own life? His family members and loved ones think otherwise, and they are not the only ones. What could make a stable, gregarious, newly married man who had just made plans for the weekend suddenly jump off a building? Author Makita Brotman questioned in her 2018 book, An Unexplained Death, The True Story of a Body at the Belvedere. More than a decade after the incident, nobody has found the answer yet. But this
this year, Ray Rivera's death will once again be brought into the spotlight thanks to the 2020 reboot of the Unsolved Mysteries series on Netflix. Ray Rivera was a 32-year-old writer and videographer based in Baltimore, Maryland. He lived a comfortable life with his longtime partner and newly wedded wife, Allison. The couple had moved to the city from Los Angeles and had lived in Baltimore for a little over two years. Rivera had a job as the financial newsletter editor of the Rebound Report. The newsletter was started by his longtime friend, Porter Stansbury, and was produced under the publishing wing of Agora, an umbrella corporation for companies based in the Mount Vernon neighborhood. In addition to his writing job, Rivera was also an assistant coach for the men's water polo team at Johns Hopkins University. According to Rivera's wife, Allison, the two were planning to move back to Los Angeles where Rivera could pursue his dreams of screenwriting. Many sources later confirmed that Rivera was unhappy with the job he held shortly before he died, especially since the stocks he wrote about often didn't rebound as he had hoped. Rivera was also described as the kind of person who wouldn't take off without telling his wife and loved ones, but he did. Ray Rivera was last seen leaving his home in the middle-class neighborhood of Northwood on May 16, 2006. The last person known to see him alive was Claudia, his wife's work colleague who was staying over as a house guest. Allison, meanwhile, was out of town on a business trip in Richmond, Virginia. According to Claudia's account, as Brahman laid out in her book, Rivera seemed preoccupied with an assignment. At about 4 p.m., Claudia heard Rivera answer a call on his cell phone and reply, Oh shit, and run out the back door as if he was late for an appointment. He left driving his wife's car, only to come back briefly and run out again, leaving the lights and the computer on in his office. Allison tried to reach her husband on his cell phone that day, but couldn't get a hold of him. She finally called Claudia at 10 p.m. to ask about her husband, but Claudia said she hadn't seen him since he had left earlier that evening. At that point, Brahman wrote, Allison assumed her husband was just out drinking. It wasn't until the next day that she began to worry. After spending the whole day calling friends and family looking for Rivera, his wife filed a missing persons report at about 3 p.m. on May 17th. Then, on May 23rd, Allison's car was discovered at a parking lot in Mount Vernon. The next day, Rivera's body was found. The body of Ray Rivera, who had been missing for just a little over a week, was found in an abandoned meeting room in the Belvedere Hotel. His body was badly decomposed, indicating that he had been deceased for quite some time. A hole in the room's roof suggested he had leapt off the top of the Belvedere 14 floors up. Belvedere Hotel was built in the early 1900s and had a macabre history of unfortunate incidents on its grounds, including a number of suicides. In more recent years, it's been largely converted into a condo building. News of Ray Rivera's death reached Burbank, California, where he had worked as an aquatics coach at a local high school. I remember the players would sprint to the side of the pool during timeouts just to listen to what Ray had to say, recalled George Agopian, who was the assistant coach under Rivera for two seasons. The kids really responded to him because they knew he knew what he was talking about. Authorities firmly believe Ray Rivera had jumped from the 14th floor of the hotel. However, the coroner's autopsy
autopsy stated his cause of death was undetermined. Meanwhile, his wife and family suspected foul play. Not my brother, said Angel, one of his relatives skeptical of the suicide theory. It's ironic because he was terrified of heights. Rivera had no history of mental illness or sudden shock. On top of that, he had actually booked an office space for a weekend during his disappearance to finish up a project, signaling no intent of suicide. Like many unsolved cases, the uncertainty surrounding Ray Rivera's death spawned several theories online, but even those involved in the case have admitted there were really bizarre elements to his death. First, authorities were unable to retrieve video footage from the highly secure building to see what had happened when Rivera made his way to the higher floors due to a technical problem. Then, there was an obscure note uncovered from Rivera's computer. The note was typed in small print, folded up in plastic, and taped to his home computer screen along with a blank check. The note was addressed to brothers and sisters and referred to a well-played game. It also named famous people who had died, including Christopher Reeve and Stanley Kubrick, as well as ordinary people who Rivera knew in real life. The note included a request to make them, and himself, five years younger. The finding was so puzzling that investigators sent the letter to the FBI. The feds determined it wasn't a suicide note. The cryptic letter pointed to another weird detail about Ray Rivera's circumstances, his growing interest in the Freemasons. The note he left behind began and ended with phrases used in the Masonic order. A representative at a local Maryland lodge confirmed that Rivera inquired about a membership on the same day he went missing, but didn't recall anything unusual about their conversation. Shortly before his death, Rivera was also reading books related to masonry, such as The Builders. To muddy things further, his wife described a growing paranoia in Rivera in the weeks leading up to his disappearance. She told police that Rivera was unusually anxious when their home alarm had gone off and that an encounter with an unknown man at the park left her husband visibly distraught. Were these signs of psychological stress, or did Rivera believe that someone was truly after him? Perhaps the creepiest detail of all is that Rivera's sandals and phone were later found intact on the lower roof. How did they manage to survive such a big drop when their owner clearly did not? Some conspiracy theorists have pointed to Stan's very strange behavior during the investigations, particularly his avoidance of the police. His reluctance could simply be a matter of protecting his business from bad publicity. However, if Stansberry was indeed covering something up, no one knows exactly what it was. Rivera's bizarre case will be re-examined in an episode of the rebooted Unsolved Mystery series on Netflix in July 2020. Despite the strange details of his case, the police and some amateur sleuths remain unmoved from the investigation's conclusion that Ray Rivera committed suicide, but those who were closest to him still seek answers to his death. <laughs>